Welcome, Melissa Morris. We're very happy to have you as our March 2022 Composer of the Month. Thank you so much for having me out. I appreciate the opportunity. Tell us a bit about the featured composition. Um, I, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to um, write this work. Uh, it's going to be a a tribute work to Todd Kerstetter, who was an important member of the clarinet community um, to so many, and and just to the music committee uh, community. He was definitely a an important part of the music com community here at K State and um, and in Manhattan, Kansas, which is where I live. And um, so this work actually takes one of Todd's uh, improvisations that he recorded recently, kind of pretty near when he passed. It was the same year, it was earlier that year that he made this improvisation on Amazing Grace. Um, and we're gonna take that improvisation and, and write a clarinet choir work with that improvisation so that his clarinet community, his clarinet family can make music with him one more time. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, I have a, a, a special feelings for Todd for sure. Um, he was the first person I met here in Manhattan, actually. He was um, the head of the search committee when I came out and did my interview in 2017. And um, I know that I heard this again and again from everybody who had him as the head of their committee or he was a part of their committee or, or their mentor in some capacity. He just had a way of bringing out the best in everybody and made them feel right at ease as soon as they came out and, and visited the campus. And he was probably um, one of their best experiences with visiting the campus and, and made us all wanna come back and, and work there. And so I, I feel similarly where I, I came out and, and he was the first person that I met and immediately I felt at ease and like I was gonna be able to do my best and that he was rooting for me. And, and so um, I had a great experience in my interview at K-State and, and um, then when they offered the position to me, um, I was very excited to accept and then Todd, became my mentor for the next few years. And so he helped me learn about tenure and helped me learn about um, more about teaching and, and he advocated for me. And I just feel really grateful for the example that he was. And I watched him with his students and the way that he did things and conducted himself. And I just was always really impressed. I, I performed with him in the Kanzawin Quintet and and um, which is our faculty woodwind quintet. He and Jackie, all, actually his wife, and, and we still perform together. She's a, a pillar of light and goodness. She's just amazing. Um, and, uh, and I performed with him in the Topeka Symphony. In fact, uh, he was performing, I mean, just his whole life, even right up until the end, it was pretty amazing to um, see how how strong and persevering he was, he was through it all. And, and I, um, he played on our Topeka Symphony concert in January, 2021. Um, he was the, playing E flat on Rite of Spring and, and he sounded as, as brilliant as ever, just beautiful and, and inspiring playing and, and precise and sparkling and piercing. And so um, I, he set quite the example for so many of us. And I'm really grateful to be able to play, you know, share some part of a role and a tribute to Todd. And um, so after his passing, I didn't know about this particular recording actually of Amazing Grace. And, and after his passing, Austin McFarland approached me about the possibility of a, of a commission for this instrumentation for clarinet choir and then he showed me this recording and I was so moved and I felt like um well it felt like Todd was in the same room and we were just listening to it over zoom he was just screen sharing the recording over zoom but it was um 
it was really moving. And I heard him through the lines. You could tell, you could hear his mannerisms and in the jazz idioms that he was in the inflection that he was um, using and, and in his tone and taper and, and leading through the lines. It was just really, really special. And um, so I, I've, you know, I am really grateful to be able to take this awesome recording and, and be able to write a clarinet choir piece that will incorporate this recording. Um, I'm excited to transcribe it actually, because I, I've always loved the transcription process because there's so much to learn about a performer and their, um, and the way that, about an improviser and and the language that they're improvising in um, by transcribing it. Something that I, I took uh, a couple of semesters of jazz improvisation at uh, CCM when I was in my doctorate, three semesters and it was on oboe, which I was really glad that they let me do. And um, one of the, my favorite practices of all of the course was the improvisation Pro, or not the improvisation, sorry, that, well, I loved that, of course, but the transcription project, when I transcribed and, and got to play along with Miles Davis or Cannonball Adderley or anybody, I just felt like I learned so much about the language and, and felt like I kind of knew that uh, performer in some capacity. And so I feel like it's going to be a really um, special process to be able to transcribe the solo too. And I, I kind of hope that I could it, in doing the transcription, it could work either with the recording or with somebody performing the transcription of Todd's playing too as a soloist. So it could work in both ways. So, wow, that sounds like such a cool project. Um, I'm actually part of that consortium and get to play in the choir at Clarinet Fest in Reno. So I'm really looking forward to being a part of that. And Todd also was a dear friend to both my husband, Joshua and I, and we've been devastated without him. Um, the clarinet community is definitely mourning his loss. Um, we're gonna go on to the next question. What other works have you written for clarinet? Um, so I'm an oboist and when I started composing, well, I guess I say I'm an oboist, but in the very beginning, when I first started, um, learning music, it was on piano. And so my very first compositions were on piano because I was just, you know, dinking around on the, <laughs> on the piano and trying to come up with something that I liked. I, we did have a composition competition it was kind of an arts competition that um, I tried to uh, submit something for every year when I was in elementary and middle school and high school, and it was called the Reflections Competition, and um, and I had some success um, in that competition. They had a regional level and a state level and then a national level, and and so I was glad to compete and have some things go on to nationals at the end or state finals and. And um, I started out just writing for piano. And then maybe the next year I thought, well, what if I tried for a piano duet? And then the next year well, I'll try something for, how about I'll incorporate a flute or a, or a vocal part. And so then, um, so I hadn't, I, I think the last thing that I did for the reflections competition before I went to college was for band. I wrote a band work and, and that was probably my very first time I wrote for clarinet was just in that capacity. But even then I was really drawn to the, the vocal qualities of the clarinet, the, the taper, the, the blend of several clarinets together. I think it's really beautiful in band that there's, there's so many clarinet voices and that, that choir quality that blend is is super special so my band piece now that I'm thinking back back in high school it it started with a a, a kind of a clarinet trio what well, was a clarinet section so in three parts and they were and it was just the clarinets in the beginning and and then another moment in the middle where it was just a clarinet so um then I uh, went to college and I was studying oboe performance. I wasn't sure in the beginning if I was gonna go into oboe performance or piano performance or composition. I kind of had my feet in a couple of different places. And, and ultimately I, was, I decided by the time I got to college that it was gonna be between oboe performance or composition. And then 
I decided by my second year that it would be oboe performance, but that I wanted to keep on taking every composition course that I could um, because I just, I, it was all really important to me and an important part of the, what, the things that I loved about music and being a musician. And I didn't really want to have to give any of it up. And so um, I continued trying to take composition courses of a variety, some, some of the like new music composition courses, some songwriting, some counterpoint, just a variety. And, um, and then uh, when I was nearing my senior year of college, I asked my teacher about the possibility of um, composing a piece for my senior recital and she was very supportive and so I, I wrote this piece and and some jazz idioms did find their way in because I, I had been I'd played a little bit in high school um, jazz band piano and and um, and uh, um, I I had some like I, I remember driving it um, to and from lessons with my dad and, or my mom but when it when it was my dad his choice was um to listen to jazz on the radio and so I just feel like I always kind of had a special part of in my heart you know and and um or a special place in my heart I should say and and um and so when I was writing the piece I remember thinking that I wished I, well I felt this way for a long time I wish there was something jazz oboe out there and I know that there now that I've started to learn more about the vast repertoire for oboe it seems like it, it might not be because we're just you know this kind of uh, instrument that there's there's only a couple of us we're not obscure maybe but there's only a couple of us in orchestra and there's only a couple of us in band you know and so um though our repertoire is a lot less vast than piano we it's so vast still as an, and as i'm learning more and more i realize gosh there are all of these great pieces that are being written with some with jazz idioms that are incorporated some world music some lots of new music that's being written that's just so wonderful and um but then I, I, I decided that I wanted to include some jazz idioms in my uh, piece because I wanted to play jazz oboe. So, <laughs> so they found their way in to Four Personalities, which is the piece that I wrote then. And, and I, um, it's based on the Hartman personality test and, and uh, which kind of defines personalities into colors. Uh, yellow, white, blue, red, and so um, so I wrote this piece and brought it to my teacher, and and she was really supportive. And my plan was just to play it for the senior recital, and ta da, that was the thing, you know. And uh, but she uh, was really great at seeing well what more could be done with this. And she said, well, why don't you send it to Trevco Music Publishing and see what Trevor Kramer thinks? And maybe he'll, maybe he'll like it. And, and she said, why don't you send it to Nancy Ambrose King? And she was the president of the International Double Read uh, um, Association then. Um, and the, she teaches at University of Michigan. And she said, why don't you see what she thinks and and maybe she'll want to perform it at some point and and so I was like well okay I'll send it there and we'll see what happens and and I was really grateful that um Trevco wanted to publish the piece and and Nancy King wanted to perform the piece and and she decided to perform it at IDRS 2008 which was a really big deal for me in in that I feel like it really launched my composition career which was you know really small or not really existent then um to into something more and and helped it to kind of jump start it and and grow it and and get with some international um presence and so i'm very grateful to my teacher who um could see what more could be done and continued to encourage me to um look at things that way and see how i could take what I had and, and make it more. And so um, since then I started receiving commissions for works and and initially it was for oboe, oboe piano, oboe in, um, in a variety of on, chamber ensembles, but then it started branching out until it, you know, I there was an oboe concerto and then later there was a, um, a piece that was just for orchestra or just for band and, cello concerto and just a variety of different instrumentations and and so some of my works um, for clarinet are clarinet in chamber ensembles but um, some 
clarinet only works have begun to um, come out of some of this too. So um, in 2010, I wrote a piece called Motion. It was a commission by Arizona State University for flute, oboe, clarinet, and bassoon. It's a four movement work that just is kind of about the movements we make with our body, riding a bike, um, stretching or tiptoeing or strutting. So, and then in 20, um, oh, I think I have the wrong date put here in the other memos so I can fix that really quick. But in 2013, I wrote a piece that was originally for oboe and bassoon and piano called Up and Away. It's the story of a balloon, but it's not really about a balloon. It's about life. And, um, and uh, so it was originally for oboe, bassoon, and piano. And that was actually commissioned by my teacher from Brigham Young University. And she played it at IDRS 2014. And then later, you and your husband recommissioned it for uh, clarinet, bass, clarinet, and piano. That happened maybe four or five years after that. So, um, And then I wrote a piece called Knickknack for Oboe, Clarinet, and Bassoon, and this is, was composed in 2017. It was a commission by ROCO, the, which was formerly known as the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra, and now they go by ROCO. Awesome organization that's really promoting a lot of new music and commissioning a lot of mu new music now. Um, so uh, I have a work called Melting Pot for Woodwind Quintet, and um, and it was also composed in 2017 um, for the originally for the Pacific Sound Woodwind Quintet. And then re it was originally written actually for doubling musicians too, because they doubled on a couple of different instruments. And then it was recommissioned as a traditional woodwind quintet too. So um, and uh, a piece called Where the Colors Fall. Um, that's a woodwind dectet, so a double woodwind quintet. Uh, which also includes clarinet, two clarinets, and and that was composed in 2017 for the um, for Brigham Young University Idaho. A piece called "Eyes to See Them, Lips to Tell" for Reed Quintet, which was commissioned for your Paradise Winds, and um, and that was in 2018, and um, and then a piece called "Dumbarton Oaks." Uh, this was com commissioned in 2019 by the U.S. Air Force Woodwind Quintet, and um, a piece called Tlapali Tlahuili, and this is a concerto for flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, uh, soloists, and orchestra, and it was commissioned by Rocco in 2021. And then, well, I guess it was commissioned in 2020, but finished in 2021. And then Kanza Parable, this is a woodwind quintet plus piano, so a woodwind sextet. And it was composed in 2021, also a commission by Rocco. I was their composer in residence for the 2020 to 2021 year. So I wrote three works for them and two of them happened to feature clarinet. So, so that's a list of the current works that I have written that include clarinet, so. Fantastic. That's quite a list. I'm learning about some new ones that I definitely will go home and check out later. Um, since you have already written for Reed Quintet, this question is regarding that. What's your encouragement composer to composer or performer to performer about engaging Reed Quintet as a medium? It seems like this is a pretty new medium, right? Right. How, I, I wonder, since you're performing in, in Reed Quintet so much, what's the, I guess, the earliest work for Reed Quintet that it exists? Well, it would have to go back to Califax and their repertoire starts in even, I think, the 1980s. And they did a lot of self uh, transcriptions and there's some early original works. Um, off the top of my head, I wouldn't know exactly which one is the, the earliest one, but if you dive into their huge repertoire, I'm sure you could find exactly the first piece. That's awesome. It's really kind of a a really new ensemble then that people are writing for. And I love it too. I think that one of the 
unique, well, there's so many unique things about the, the timbre of the ensemble, the capabilities of the ensemble. I kind of feel like there's a savory and a sweet quality to the instrumentation, which I always love because I feel like the oboe in a way is kind of a sweet slash savory, you know, instrument. Sometimes it can be a little salty. <laughs> a little sweet and um but beyond just like the sweet and savory of the reed quintet i feel like um sometimes it can be intense and biting in quality and then sometimes tranquil and silky and and it's um virtuosic um in in the instrumentation there's loud dynamic capabilities gorgeous tapers fast playing slow playing so much can be done by this colorful instrumentation, um, some extended technique that I think all of the instruments, well, I know all instruments in general have something that they would consider extended technique, but uh, a lot of these instruments seem like they're fairly new besides the oboe. The oboe's kind of an oldie. It's been around since <laughs> Baroque oboe and then, you know, but, but even clarinet was just, you know, Mozart and beyond. And then I'm assuming that bass clarinet followed Even that mm -hmm. yeah and then saxophones pretty young too bassoon and oboe I guess they're kind of the the grandparents but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean they they got other bells and whistles added to them so they could feel new and trendy also as they <laughs> evolved so <laughs> but because the instruments are so new I think that um that they were probably created with some of the new music um in mind what what composers were commanding instruments to do then regarding uh, dynamic capabilities and and vir um, virtuosity and technique capabilities and and even beyond that once the instruments existed then people were constantly playing around with them to see what they could do regarding like harmonic trills or timbral shifts or or unique articulations with slap sounds and and key sounds and all sorts of things and and these instruments really uh lend themselves to a lot of super unique sounds so yeah i love the instrumentation awesome well you've mentioned this briefly already um but i want to come back to swing and jazz influences in your writing swing and jazz is an element that you frequent in compositions uh, where do you get your inspirations for that? Is that a musical style that you grew up with or learned about in school? Yeah, um, I mentioned briefly that I uh, was did jazz piano when I was in um, jazz band in high school. I really had a, a great time. I think that one of the things that was my favorite was the freedom from the page, you know, freedom from the manuscript. And it wasn't just that it was freedom from the page because there's guidance given in improvisation. Sometimes I think that it, depending on how much you know about jazz improvisation um, or depending on how much people know about jazz improvisation, they might just think that it's kind of made up on the fly, which it kind of is. But with all of this theory background and understanding of what chords or what notes work well under these chords or what or what scales work well in these passages and 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 so it's kind of like a marriage of of a theory and composition but in real time you know and so it um and then with with the heavy dose of expression and whatever your soul is feeling, but within the bounds of, you know, let's let's use these scales and let's use these chords and and build something neat in the moment. And um, so I I loved that feeling of being able to really listen and respond to um the other people in the jazz band when they played something trying to play something like it back or something that would reciprocate what they were saying and i think that um is one of the things now that i love so much about chamber music as i'm as i'm thinking about that is that there's that reciprocity there's a you know like trying to really feel what they're feeling and think what they're thinking as they're playing and and trying to match articulations and dynamics and 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 listen to what they're doing it's like a communication beyond words you know and so um i i really thought that that was special when i started in um participating in jazz band and and um i was already drawn to jazz 
because I mentioned that, you know, it was something that my dad listened to frequently when we were driving in the car. So there's some nostalgia attached to it. And then, and then when I was in college and my, met my wonderful husband, he's a percussionist. And so he had all of these jazz bands that he wanted us to listen to too. And all of these fantastic, um, a percussionist who were super influential in jazz and he loved jazz. And so both of us were interested in, in digesting as much of it as we possibly could. Um, there was a, when we were students at Brigham Young University in Salt Lake, they had a, a, a sort of a subscription called Jazz at the Sheraton that was in Salt Lake. And we would frequently go and get student tickets, which were cheaper, you know, and so we saw Chick Corea, and we saw Tower of Power, and we saw a, a whole bunch of really fantastic musicians. Salt Lake has a great jazz festival every year, and so we would go to the jazz festival and, and listen to all of their awesome guests that they brought in for the lineup, and um, so and just, you know, back in the CD buying days, that was definitely something that we were doing is like, okay, what can, what new jazz CD can we buy? And we took our jazz history class together and it was just something that was really a, a fun thing for all of us. And, and now our kids love it too. And so, um, but, you know, I play the oboe. And so I, like I said, there weren't a lot of opportunities for me to be very jazzy. And <laughs> I wish that there were then. And so as I was writing, I mean, one of the things that kind of guided my writing is I'd like to occasionally get to be a little jazzy or learn more about the jazz idioms through composition and through playing it on oboe. And so um, as I continued to do that, and then as I started my doctorate, I noticed that I, one of the classes that I had really wished that I'd been able to take in my undergrad and my master's, but I hadn't had time for, and I hadn't known if they would let me on the oboe. I bet they would have, but I didn't, I, I just hadn't had time up, the, up to that point to take this class, but I really wanted to take jazz improvisation on the oboe. And so when I went to CCM, that was one of my like top priorities beyond my oboe studies was let's take jazz on the oboe. I want to learn more about incorporating these idioms as a performer in composition, because I think if I feel them in my fingers, I think if I play them and understand it that way, it's going to inform my writing even more. And so I took three semesters of it. They were, my teachers were super supportive of jazz oboe, which I thought was so great. And, and I learned so much and just loved it. It was, it was exactly what I hoped for and, and more. And I learned so much. So, um, that's kind of my background with jazz. Um, and I don't know, I feel like there's, there's this really awesome area merging area between classical and jazz that can be so much fun. Um, and I, I feel like I, I, um, <laughs> there's something in the expression of jazz that sometimes makes me feel like the freedom of it. I don't know. I don't know what, how, how else to explain it besides just that, that it feels like you can really, that the improvisation process, whether it's jazz or another style, it really feels like it's a, like a, an expression of the soul. So yeah. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. Okay. So the next question, how would you describe your music? Oh, um, well, uh, one of the things that um, I have discovered has been important to me in my writing, especially when I, I mean, sometimes when you receive a commission as a composer, it's been decided already what they want you to write about, you know, they, they want you to write about um, this particular event or this painting or something. And that's always exciting because I think that it's really neat writing in within the bounds of what somebody else has imagined that the subject could be, because I think that it, it challenges you in a new way as a composer. Um, but I also think that it's really awesome to have the opportunity to just get to decide what you want to write about too. And um, when I, I have found that when I have decided what I wanted the piece to be about. It's uh, that I have been interested in writing to the human experience, I guess, to life and, and just, I guess, humanity through and in music. And so um, I feel like there's something 
that's really special about finding meaning, guidance, hope, and reconciliation through music. And, and there was is something healing as a composer too, when I can use the compositional medium to express the feelings of the soul, happiness and sadness and laughter and grief and fear, anxiety, joy. And, um, and sometimes I try to express those feelings as a type of parable, like in, in a, I have the up and away where it's really about a, it's about, about a balloon, but it's really about life. And I have another piece uh, for English horn and piano called Chrysalis. And it's about um, a, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, but it's a, a really, um, it's about Christ. And, um, and so I think that there's, um, but sometimes I, I think I'm more overt about the way that I try to express those feelings. Um, I have a piece called coping and it's for flute, uh, oboe and piano. And each movement is, uh, is titled after a way that you might cope with anxiety or depression or a number of difficulties in life. The first movement is called counting and breathing. And the second movement is praying. And the third is running. And um, another piece that I wrote this past year called ruminations. And um, they were kind of re personal reflections on feelings during the pandemic. And so the first, and it's for solo oboe. The first movement is called um, woulda, coulda, shoulda. And the second is called emotions masked and unmasked. And then the third is called enough's enough. So um, I think that um, I found that um, I feel a sense of wholeness when I can express some sort of the human experience through music. Wow, that's really lovely. Thank you. Um, what are some of the important influences on your work? I, I would... As I was thinking about this, I realized that I we're influenced by everything we listen to, everything we digest, everything we perform. Sometimes when I'm performing, I'm I'm thinking about, oh my goodness, this is this is I, I feel like I'm being taken to school by like the the last time I I felt this way was when I was playing Daphnis and Chloe with the orchestra with Topeka Symphony and I felt like Ravel was taking me to school the orchestration the like just the writing of my own part and all of the lines I was like oh you're using this chord now and you're using this chord and this is your progression and this is how you're you know dancing between the different woodwinds and everything I just I, I felt like I was what, being taken to school. Um, but I feel that way sometimes when I'm listening to musicians in concert and, and uh, sometimes when I'm studying a score or, or um, so I, I feel like I, I'm, or when I look up a, some new music that I heard about and, and listen to a new artist and, uh, or a new composer and their works, I just feel like it's, um, all, anything we digest is, is influencing us in some way and what we write or how we perform or whatever. Um, but uh, I mean, I already spoke to some of my jazz um, artists that were kind of inspired me. Of course, some of my favorites of the classics are Cannonball Adderley and John Coltrane and Dave Brubeck and and Clifford Brown and Miles Davis. And, but I also like new groups like Snarky Puppy and I love classical artists. Um, my, I feel like when my piano teacher introduced me to Chopin, my eyes like opened. I just feel like there was something so beautiful about the, the harmonies and the poetic quality of the, of the melod melodies and the melismas and everything. It was just, so beautiful. Um, but I, and then the first time I played a Mahler symphony, I was just, my eyes were opened. It was so amazing. Or, or when I, um, played some Bernstein, when I played West Side Story, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is the best, you know, but I feel, felt that way many times. This is the best. No, this is the best. This is the best. And you, and you learn from all of that. I love movie music. I, I feel like that's one of my favorite parts about going to a new movie is, is listening to the music and in a way having that composer 
take me to school again. And, and um, I love looking for new composers. I'm always looking for new composers for my own instrument. And just in general, um, uh, some of my favorite composers right now, I really love Rena Esmail. Her work is fantastic. I think that her, her writing is so beautiful. Um, there's a beautiful new oboe concerto by Oscar Navarro that's just really stirring and special. I love the works of Missy Mazzoli and Jesse Montgomery. And there's just so much good music out there to be inspired by. And I feel like I learn every time I listen to more or play more and in a different way when you're listening, you learn in a different way when you're listening versus when you're playing. And so, yeah. Awesome. What is your composing process like? Do you have a regular routine time of day that you like to work? What tools do you use to compose? Um, I, <laughs> my, I don't know if my routine would look much like a routine to anybody because I, I feel like I'm wearing a lot of hats during the day. I, I'm, um, I teach oboe and music theory at Kansas state and I'm playing the Topeka symphony. Um, but I'm also a mother and I have two kids, 14 and 12. And, and I, um, and I have my research interests are in both performance and composition. So it's kind of a, a Tetris game trying to piece together the, <laughs> the when everything is going to happen. And every week really does look so different from every week. And I think it's been especially the case this semester as I've been out of town a lot for some really fun performing opportunities and, and um, premiere opportunities of new works too. Um, so I have found that there are some things that can be done no matter where I am. So uh, unless I'm driving, I probably, well, even there's some, there are some parts of the composition process that can even be done while I'm driving. So when I drive to and from Topeka, there's a lot of time to think there's time to call family, of course, too, and just catch up with people. I really, I actually enjoy those drives a lot because I feel like it gives me some meditation time and some time to catch up with people I really care about. And, um, but I've also found that that's been a really good time to think about the new works that I might have in the pipeline. And if I start to hear some melodies come to mind or something, I'll just quickly grab my memos on my phone and try to sort of sing it into the mic and then catalog it for later, you know, and um, catalog it just by saying, this is what this melody is, and then push play and then sing it and then, you know, put it aside. And um, so that can be done. Or sometimes I've even made some memos where I've talked through some of the ideas to myself so I could remember for later because one of the things that I found is that I can't always remember I might have a good idea in the middle of the day or in the middle of the night and then I forget later what it was and so I'm trying to be conscious about cataloging it somehow or archiving it somehow so I have it for later and uh, so that can be done when I'm driving and then um, editing can be done um, if I have finale on my uh, my laptop it can be done from a plane it can be done from a hotel room it can be done from <laughs> wherever i think the things that i really need to have you know some quiet time for and some time set aside which sometimes comes during the day if i have i i try to schedule my at least one day of the week where i have a couple of hours that i get to leave early before my kids and my husband get home so i can just have some time to either practice or, or compose. And, and that is when I do that, um, when I have that time, I use it for improvisation on my instrument on, you know, the piano, because sometimes that works when everybody's home, but, but sometimes I'm able to engage a little bit more without feeling self-conscious or like I'm making too much noise and, or, or like there's any interruption, you know, that it's easier to, um, improvise and come up with ideas that way when I'm on my own. And, um, and the, uh, the instrumentation or just getting the notes on the page part, which I use finale for, I use finale and I use it, um, a MIDI input just a, a standard synthesizer. It's actually one I've had for a really long time. My dad got it for me when I was in high school in Alesis 8.1, I think is what it is. And, and I, so I've had it for ages, but it's been fantastic for inputting. I've replaced the computer a couple of times and I've certainly upgraded Finale a lot of times, but the MIDI input device is, 
is the one I've been using for forever and, and um, it's been great. And so I use, that's one of the things that works probably better when I have just some real concentration time too. So um, that has sometimes happened in the middle of the night when everybody else is asleep. And sometimes it's happened during the day. It just kind of depends on, on what my time's like. A lot of my big writing projects will really come to fruition in breaks too. If I have uh, my summer break or my Christmas break, I feel like I'm spending a lot of time writing then when I'm not out of town or traveling or anything, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time writing then and uh, spring break and, um, and Thanksgiving break too. So this past spring break, I, um, I have been working on since the beginning of the year, a concerto for two oboes and wind band. And it's one that I'm gonna premiere with um, Kelly Trace, an oboist from um, Minnesota. She teaches at a university there and, and we're gonna premiere it with the Kansas State University um, wind ensemble. And she's actually the band director, Frank Trace's daughter. So we're gonna perform it together and um, at the end of April. So I've been working on this piece since the beginning of the year and finished it um, at the in spring break. Like I finished all the parts extraction and everything that happened during spring break. And then also another piece for flute oboe duo that I wrote during spring break too. So, um, so that's when a lot of the big writing projects happen kind of in a burst, you know, when I have a, a little bit of reprieve from some of the other um, components of the schedule that, um, and there's some time freed up that way. So, um, it doesn't really look like a, a predictable schedule, like maybe some composers, you know, <laughs> um, do, but, um, but it, I, I like the variety too. Uh, and I feel like the variety some, and some, where some weeks are really heavy in performance and, and some weeks are more heavy in composition. I feel like they kind of fuel the interest for the other two and, and the inspiration for the other, at least for me. So. Wow. Wow. You're so creative. That's amazing. I, I would have never thought about the voice memo thing. That's incredible. Smart too. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it probably, if anybody got a hold of my phone, I'd be really embarrassed, you know, as I start <laughs> listening through them because I'm certainly not a vocalist, but <laughs> Wow. Wow. All right. Next question. How has the coronavirus pandemic impacted your work? Well, um, I mean, as a performer, a lot of my performing opportunities came to a halt in March, 2020. And, um, I, of course, as performers, we were all like, what do we do? We've got to figure out a way to, you know, um, to continue creating, but I also felt like I had had a lot of pieces up the pop pipeline that I was concerned about, you know, not concerned, but trying to be creative about how I was going to meet these deadlines. And now I really got to thrust myself into the work full force. And as my, you know, performance projects were going to be put to the side for a little bit. And so um, I feel like some of my best writing happened in 2020. And so um, I, I kind of, it was a painful time for a lot of us, but I feel also like it was a focused time for me on composition and I learned a lot. I had some um, unique commissions that really um, taught me a lot about different mediums. Um, one was a cello concerto that I finished in 2020 and that's going to be premiered next month on April 8th or 9th, the whichever day is Saturday. So um, by the Richmond Symphony and Andres Diaz, I'm going to go out then and hear the premiere. And um, and so it was a commission we um, by the Barlow Endowment, and they were initially going to premiere the work in 2021, but it needed to be pushed to 2022 because their 2020 to 2021 season was abbreviated due to COVID. And so, um, so I'm really excited about them performing this work and, and this thing that's happening. And, um, but I, I feel like I learned so much from the process of writing for cello and writing for orchestra in this way. I'd written for orchestra a couple of times before, but I feel like it was, I, I was learning a lot of new things this time. And, and um, another opportunity was writing a piece for um, 
the the piece I mentioned for flute, oboe, clarinet, and bassoon soloist and orchestra called Tilapali Tilahuili for Rocco that was written during this time also finished at like the very beginning of 2021. So it was written mostly during 2020. And um, I learned a lot about um, orchestra, orchestral writing also from this work and um, a couple of other unique uh, commissions that really taught me something different about uh, a, an instrument that I hadn't written before. I wrote a piece for contrabass flute and that was a, a really unique uh, opportunity. I had never even, I didn't even know what it was before I was commissioned to write the piece. <laughs> and then, you know, I did lots of Zooms with, with my friend, Karen Large, who commissioned the work and had her try this or try that. And, you know, it was just really fun kind of exploring the capabilities of the instrument. So I learned a lot from that. Another commission for Berenbau and piano and Berenbau is like a, it's a Brazilian percussion instrument and it's a musical bow where, so it's a bow and it's attached to a, a rod that also has a gourd and the gourd can move up and down and and change the pitch of the string. There's a string on this side and a string on this side of the gourd. And when they put it up, it changes the pitch of this string and then they can pull it down. It changes the pitch of, of either string. And so we definitely were working together via Zoom to figure out where we even wanted the pitches to be because depending on where the gourd was, it, it changes how many, what the pitch relationships are between the two strings. But then on when they play it, they play it with a coin kind of pushed up against the string so they can get three different pitches from the top string and maybe two or three, maybe four, I'm trying to remember from the bottom string. So, but not at the same time. So you have to flip it around to use the other string. So it was a really, we, because we were trying to use it in a melodic way, whereas often it's used in a percussive way, um, it kind of presented some unique um, challenges and learning opportunities. So that was a really cool, uh, fun thing that I did during the pandemic too. And just a number of other um, chamber works that I was able to really focus on and compose during the pandemic. Um, a couple of pieces actually for English horn bassoon and piano that are gonna be premiered at IDRS this year. Um, a, another piece for oboe and piano, a piece for viola and piano. And that was my first time writing for solo viola and a piece for violin and piano. Again, my first time writing for solo violin and a piece for double read ensemble, a piece that I wrote for myself for oboe and piano, but I played them kind of at the same time. And so that was something that I was trying to explore that was sort of different and unique about this piece. So I felt like it was a real learning opportunity where we were trying to be creative as performers and find new ways to kind of share our art. I also felt like it was a real time for creativity and learning about writing for different instruments for me as a composer too. So, yeah. Wow. So you got a lot done during the pandemic. <laughs> I, tr I tried to, but you know, I mean, there was probably a lot I didn't get done too. It's like we all felt you know, it was right, a little bit right. of both. So. Well, that's an impressive list. That's amazing. Um, our next question, now that things are hopefully starting to return to normal, I say that in quotation marks, what is one thing you're especially excited to be able to do again? Um, so like non-musically speaking, I'm just really excited about the prospect of traveling more with my family again. I love traveling and my last big traveling experience was IDRS 2018 and I went with my husband and that was a really special uh, trip for us and and you were there too and That's Renata great. was just really an amazing place and and um and so I'm excited to travel more with my family. We're trying to take our kids to all 50 states before they graduate. So we've got a few more to go. We've made some good progress. And even during the pandemic, there were some places where we felt like that would probably be safe to go. We did some national parks in the Dakotas and some other things. And we did um, so, lots of national parks and that was really fun. And so um, we're excited about 
traveling. I, uh, I love that um, the hope that I think that a lot of our international conventions are going to be returning back to in person coming up. There's such a, a beauty about the ability to gather. And I am so I feel like it's unifying. And it's it's just a really important for all different organizations organizations to be able to gather and it builds community so I'm excited that it looks like it's going to be safe to gather and I say that with apprehension of course but I'm crossing my fingers and hoping so well ICA is too we are very excited for our live in-person festival in Reno this summer so we are hopeful as well Um, tell us about a current project or two that you're excited about I mentioned my uh, cello concerto that I finished in 2020. And um, so this, I'm very excited about the premiere. This is gonna be premiered by cellist Andres Diaz in the Richmond, Indiana Symphony. And the piece is called Alone. And it's dedicated to those who lost their lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I'm, I feel really grateful that this is um, happening and I think it's gonna be a special event. I also mentioned this double concerto that I am uh, just finished and I'm really excited. I've been practicing very excitedly for this um, premiere of the double concerto for two oboes and wind ensemble. Um, I'll play a piano reduction version of it with uh, Kelly Trace at IDRS in 2022. And I'm really excited to play it with um, Frank Trace in the KSU wind ensemble at the end of April. The piece is called Of Infinity and movements are mirrors, eternities and circles. So I'm really excited. Amazing. I will definitely catch the performance at IDRS. I look forward to it. Awesome. Uh, one more question. And I probably should have asked this at the beginning. Tell us a bit about yourself <laughs> where you grew up and such. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so I was born in Fort Worth, Texas. I lived there until I was five. And then my family moved to Utah. I grew up in Utah. Um, I started my piano studies pretty much in conjunction with when I moved to Utah and then started oboe when I was starting middle school. And I was mentioned that I was interested with composition and from, you know, pretty much initially when I started piano, because I was, I was interested in learning my music, but I was also interested in making up my own. And so my parents were really good about encouraging me to make sure that I did practice my, you know, my music that I was given every week from my teacher. um, So that if I did practice all of it, then maybe the last 10 minutes of my practice, if I was practicing for an hour or something, the last 10 minutes of my practice could be improvisation or something like that, you know, because that was something that I was really, was starting to take over my practice because that's just what I wanted to do. And so they, it was like a deal, you know, but I felt like it was a really great carrot that they were dangling because, you know, it kind of sparked the interest for both. And the more that I learned, um, the more that I worked on what my teachers wanted me to work on, the better my compositional ideas became, you know, so it was, it was good to get better as a performer. And I, I really feel like that I was benefited by that. So they were very supportive of my musical studies. And I remember my first composition in fourth grade, um, they, I didn't really know how to notate it. I just kind of had it memorized what I was playing. I had just, you know, made it up and it was just there. And so my mom made an appointment for me to go to a recording studio and just kind of play it and have it notated by the record recording technician there. And, and, um, and he did a really nice job and, and uh, it was a really exciting experience for me to be able to do that and, and um, made a real impression on me as a young, you know, composer and, and um, I probably still have the tape in my, uh, in my keepsakes. I'm going to have to go and look and see if I can find it. The piece was called silently. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> So I'm going to have to go and see if I can find it. Um, but uh, they continued to support my musical endeavors, my, my, um, with, you know, lessons and in oboe and piano and composition and, and um, 
and taking me to those lessons and finding ways to support my composition if I needed a recording made or something like that. They were really very supportive. Um, I went to Brigham Young University for my undergraduate degree and um, I studied open performance and um, I met my husband there when I was, uh, I think it was in my, just before my third year and we met on a band tour and <laughs> So the tour was a, a month long tour to Scandinavia. We were both in the wind symphony. And so we were, it was a performance tour. We would, we would get to a different place. We'd perform a couple of concerts there. Like usually we'd have a concert every night, but then during the day we were sightseeing and it was, it was a really great tour. We did a, a couple of those actually at BYU. Um, the next year I went with a chamber orchestra to uh, England, Scotland, and Wales. And so there were uh, really some awesome touring opportunities there, but we really enjoyed our, our tour to Scandinavia. So the first time we talked to each other was in, in Denmark, which was cool in Copenhagen, I think it was. So, um, so we, um, so uh, we were married before the end of our undergraduate and he was pursuing a degree in music education. And um, just as he was kind of finishing and I was finished, our first was born, our son. And then a couple of years later, our daughter and, and my, around all of that same time, my husband started teaching high school band. Um, and he taught for seven years in Utah before we, and I started my master's degree at the tail end of when he was teaching in Utah. I did my master's degree um, started when my kids were like three or three and four or something like that. And, um, and, uh, finished that over like three years. I took a little bit more time because they were so young and we had a lot of family help there luckily. And that really made it possible. And, um, and then, um, we left, we all moved to Cincinnati and I did my DMA in Cincinnati from 2015 to 2017. And my husband actually did his master's degree at CCM also, and um, in music education. And so, um, and mine was the DMA, a DMA in oboe performance with the cognate in composition. So, and we finished there. And then I applied for the job at K-State in 2017. And then we moved here in um, fall of 2017 or just before fall of 2017. My husband teaches band at Junction City High School, which is just um, 30 minutes away. And so, um, and we feel really lucky because all of the pieces really fell into place and in an incredible way. And, and we feel we've been blessed with a lot of opportunities here and um, love it here. He teaches at Junction City. Like I said, it's only 20 minutes away, but I mean, Manhattan, uh, K-State is really kind of in the middle of nowhere. So we were wondering about how he was going to get a job that it was anywhere close. And then this one popped open just about a, a couple of days after I found out about my job. And so we feel really blessed to be here. And, and um, the Topeka Symphony position opened up in my first year at K-State too. And so I auditioned for that position when I was in my first year here at K-State and have been principal since um, then. So um, that's kind of what brought us here. We love it here. And I teach, um, I teach oboe and music theory at K-State. And I also teach uh, a music business class. I teach uh, the oboe portion of woodwind techniques and um, aural skills. I teach a songwriting class sometimes, and I have also taught composition lessons. And and um, so I and I'm a member of the Konza Wind Quintet. So we really love it here. It's a great place. So. Wow, you are very busy. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, next question. Are there other musical activities or projects that are important to you beyond composing? Um, well, I mentioned my performance and, and just that in this job, since my job is oboe and, and music theory, um, uh, my main gig is, is being an oboist and an oboe teacher. And so, um, I really love all things oboe, of course, and I love performing the oboe. I, um, I uh, love playing with the Topeka Symphony. I love teaching my students. They're just so great. And, um, and uh, I just finished a, a CD. It was my second CD um, that I kind of started at the beginning of the pandemic and then finished at 
the end of the pandemic had a little bit of a break in between because the halls were all closed. We couldn't really get access to them. So, and we were trying to be safe too. And so once testing was more readily available, then we were okay with moving forward with the project. And so, um, so I just finished the CD and it's a CD of my own music and I'm performing as the oboist. And so there are a couple of pieces for oboe and piano that I'm collaborating with my um, wonderful pianist, Amanda Arrington on. And then one piece that's for oboe and percussion that I collaborated with a K-State um, percussion ensemble on. And then another piece that's solo oboe and then another piece that's two oboes English horn that I collaborated with some of my colleagues, my former DMA student friends from CCM on, and they just happen to be both in Omaha. And so it's not too far of a drive for us to get together and, and perform together. So another thing that I'm really excited about music wise is a new trio that um, I am performing in called a glow trio. And we just um, formed kind of a little bit in response to the pandemic, because I think that it, one of the things that we learned is, is what things we really enjoyed doing and what things we missed, what things we didn't miss, what things we want more of, you know, and, and so one of the things that we wanted was just to really be able to make uh, meaningful musical experiences with our friends, make music with our friends. And, and so um, I, and I'm inspired by these two women. I just love performing with them, Karen Large from Florida State and Amanda Arrington from Kansas State. And, and so we started um, kind of brainstorming how we would, um, do this since we live in different states and and so what when Karen came out um last summer we just sort of had a crash course of two days of rehearsal and then we made some recordings of some of the pieces that we hoped to be able to perform on some of the tours that we were going on and and we just found you know when when it's right it just really clicks and it's so special and it's like you can read each other's minds and and there was something special really happening that we knew we just had to have more of. And so, um, and so we continued to kind of plan these, you know, hyper-focused times where we come together and, and rehearse or any time that, you know, we, we try to utilize it to its max when we are together and, and then plan to, and, and kind of have fairly regular Zoom meetings so that we can figure out and plan for the group too. And so um, we uh, played at a, we used some of these recordings for some of the virtual conventions that we performed at that we're following. And then we performed at NACWAPI in um, Denton last semester. And then we came on tour and actually visited you and some other universities in, in Arizona and um, Nevada in, uh, in February. And we're gonna go to Ohio in um, at the tail end of actually my Richmond Symphony trip, we're gonna meet up and then perform at some schools in Ohio um, in April. And then this summer we are planning for our, we, Karen just found out that she was granted, uh, she, she was awarded a grant for a CD that we're gonna make. So we're gonna start that process of, of like some of its music that we've already played, some of its music that we're, in the process of like that's new or that we're commissioning. And so um, we'll start to work on it um, this summer. So we're really excited about that too. That's very exciting. I'll look for that later. Very exciting. Um, next question. What non-musical activities do you enjoy? Oh, I love um, spending time with my family in the mountains or prairies, hiking and biking. And I also really enjoy lap swimming. I'm not fast, so it's really at a leisurely pace, but, <laughs> but I do enjoy it. And as a family, we like playing card games, board games, video games. I kind of like the old school Mario 3, you know. <laughs> And I, we like going to concerts and movies together, going out to eat. Um, I love baking and my favorite desserts to make are cinnamon rolls and cheesecake. And so there's just so many good, fun things in the world. And so I feel like um, there's, there's a, so many great things to do and great things to fill your life with. So awesome. If you weren't a musician, what would you be? Uh, I think I would be a, a NICU nurse. Um, my son was born six weeks early and he spent a lot of time in the NICU and the nurses there were, they were 
angels and they helped us feel comfortable and supported while our son was there. It was kind of, you know, a scary time, even though he was growing, we didn't know how long he was going to be there and that he was early was nerve wracking too. And so they were really um, helpful with just helping us to feel comfortable, taking great care of him. And I just felt like their job was so important. And I thought that I, I, I thought for a little bit about seriously pursuing that, but I'm really glad that I feel like there's so much there, there's a, a real value in, in teaching and helping our students and, and we're formative in our own ways too and helping them to develop that confidence just like these nurses were helpful in helping us to feel more confident as parents. And so there's so many, in, in, there's important things about every um, job. Next question, where can people learn more about here or by your music? Um, sure. So um, they can go to Alyssa, Alyssa com to my website if they want to explore some of the uh, music that's already published or already been recorded, or if they want to send, if they're curious about a, the possibility of a commission and they want to um, inquire about that, um, there's a, a place to contact. So you can do that. And um, or on Facebook, I try to post about the hap current happenings, what's going on. So certainly there, you can find me there. And, um, and my works are published. I have a backlog of works that I need to send to Tre Trevco. So there hopefully will be more that are kind of have been in the pipeline, but I haven't sent yet, but um, to Trevco that will hopefully be published this summer. But I have several that are published by Trevco Music Publishing and one that's published by C. Allen Publications, a band work. And um, you can find recordings of my music on iTunes or Spotify, YouTube, Google Play. Um, and they might, some of my works have been recorded by MSR, Classics, Centaur, Blue Griffin, Equilibrium, Tantara, pa Parma. So um, any of those places, I guess, would be a good place to look it up. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time to share your work with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate all that you're doing to build community in the clarinet world and beyond. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Until next time. Bye. Sounds great. Bye.